Thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be there. I'm also very happy to see that there are still many people uh, listening, connected after three days of conference. I think it's a performance. So congratulations to everybody. So, um, well, I, I have hesitated before uh, choosing what I would present to you. Uh, but when I, when I saw that there were two, uh, two presentations related to real estate before, uh, I think that I had, it was an opportunity to present you uh, what we are working on, uh, namely the, the link between first globalization and the various forms that are taken by globalization today with, let's say, what's going on in regions, regional development, and with a focus on the built, the built dimension of uh, the city and of the region, okay? So, uh, in two words, what I'd like to, 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 to present to you is first to start with globalization, okay? And globalization is changing, has changed and is going to change. And if I take here uh, some very broad um, table about comparing the ways um, globalization evolved during the, the last uh, 50 years, let's say we had, let's say, Fordism, uh, we had during, let's say, 20 years, the financial regime of accumulation, okay, which was structured mainly with the, by the difference between, uh, on the one hand, the so-called real economy, with regions developing, like for example, with uh, territorial innovation models and that kind of stuff, okay, and on the other side, what was what is called the financial economy, which of course has totally different uh, development uh, processes and. Uh, uh, ways to, to, to function, okay? And uh, we could, well, they, I put here that this uh, financial accumulation regimes uh, terminated in 2008. This, of course, is highly debatable, okay? But uh, today's period is quite different, I would say. Uh, it's a period which is very open. Some speak about a transition period, and it is, of course, highly marked by, uh, first, of course, this difference between uh, activities which are concrete activities that are going on and what is going on on the digital stage, okay? This duality is very important today, especially in innovation dynamics. Uh, and other elements of uh, the contemporary period is of course what has to see with transition, the ecological transition, the en energy transition, the agroecological transition and so on and so forth. And this uh, transition uh, aspirations, let's say, of the population gives rise to an economy and activities of experience, experimentation, pilot projects, and that kind of stuff, okay? Other elements which are characteristic of today's uh, economy, uh, capitalism, of course, is not dead, far from that, and, but the financial uh, markets are more, uh, more and more unstable. And what we have for sure is that, is that GAFA or GAFAM capitalism, platform capitalism, which is developing. And another domain where uh, capitalism uh, proves to be very active today and where we have really accumulation processes is the question of real estate. Because we have more and more large investors in, in the real estate sectors. And I would like to, to speak about that. So this is a very broad, very broad uh, picture. Please do not hesitate to interrupt me if you have remarks or questions, okay? It's, it's, I would say if it is important because uh, it's not easy when you are, uh, well, to make, to make a talk uh, online. So please, if you want to, to make some interactions, don't hesitate to do it. So what I'm going to present to you is first, a changing globalization and what does it mean for urban development? Uh, the second part is about uh, let's say, how to, to link two kinds of literature. The literature about urban development and uh, regional developments explain to us how value is built through innovation, through, uh, well, many, kind, many processes. Uh, it helps us to understand the development of a region, the increase of incomes or the decrease of incomes and so on and so forth. Of course, this changes the value of what we could call the urban value. Huh? 
On the other hand, we have a literature about rents. Most of the literature about rents is about rent capturing, and where, where you have, let's say, Ricardo, and after that, Marx, and all this literature, which focuses on rent, very often is about rent capturing. But there are very, very few uh, relations between both of these, uh, of these fields. And what we are working on today is really to, to look at the role of real estate in regional and city development. And very paradoxically, there exists no theory or very few theory which are really articulating both. And the second part, the third part, sorry, will be a theoretical proposal uh, just to consider uh, urban development process as a complex process. I will explain why, what, I mean, why, uh, what I mean behind that, uh, that word of complexity. So let's start with the following points. We are still in a world where financial markets, financial players uh, play an absolutely central role. And this is, of course, is, is the, the result of the, of, uh, the, of neoliberalism. In the 80s, Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan uh, decided that capital could, could move across space. And uh, since capital is mobile, it has created, it has been, um, sorry, uh, its mobility has been encouraged and developed through the, the financial industry. And today, a large part of the economy and of the society is managed following the criteria, the management criteria of financial markets and on fi financial companies. Okay, this is the important point. Okay. Of course, it was very different in the, in the Fordist regime. And today, many, many things like our rents or pensions when we are elderly, when we are retired, are largely decided by financial markets. Public, public policies are largely conditioned by uh, poly, uh, financial markets. What we can do in the, in the COVID uh, crisis is largely determined by the monetary policy, which is devoted to financial markets, and so on and so forth. So how did uh, financial uh, markets influence uh, regional development? First, during the 90s, we had uh, uh, the, the control was taken by big groups and financial companies over productive uh, activities. All the SMEs that, nearly all the SMEs that existed at that time were incorporated in very large groups, okay? So this through a process of fusion and acquisitions. Uh, during the 2000 and up to now, we had a big financialization of real estate and infrastructures. Uh, Cases like Spain in the 2000s or Ireland, uh, and all what led to the crisis of 2008 are a very good example of this, of this phenomenon. Uh, today, the link between uh, real estate and finance is probably the center of our economic systems. If you know Manuel Albers, uh, he used to, he's used to say that in the 60s it was the military, in, industrial military complex, which was at the center of the production, production structure. And Manuel Albers says, okay, today the center of the economic system is the uh, real estate financial complex, okay? And this is true in Europe, in the US, and it, above all in China, of course. If we had a cri uh, real estate crisis in China, it would be probably a very, very uh, uh, strong crisis. And finally, since uh, for the last, let's say, 15 to 20 years, uh, we had another kind of globalization which developed, which is linked to uh, uh, the mobility of consumers. I mean, tourists, students, elderly people, um, people who want to ju just shoppers, or, or ha we have health tourism, uh, ma many kinds of tourism. The mobility of consumers has developed a lot and is influencing a lot. Uh, regional and city development. And of course, all these various uh, phenomena play together in order to, let's say, uh, influence the development of, uh, of the cities. And cities, of course, have to get inserted in this globalization. This is another representation, still very descriptive, let's say. Uh, here you have time. 
and here you have, of course, an increasing role of internet and of transportation infrastructures. We could say that in the, the, the 80s, 90s, the main globalization was linked to the mobility of traded goods and services. Okay, this is the World Trade Organization, the EU market and all that stuff. And this gave rise to uh, territorial innovation models, global production networks, and so on and so forth, all these theories that you've heard about. A little bit later, we had the big literature about the mobility of knowledge and, and qualified workers. Uh, as you know, the, the internet has totally changed the spatial form of learning processes. For example, 50, 50 years ago, if you wanted to know something about, I don't know, uh, perhaps uh, aircraft engines, for instance, I take one example like that, you had to go to the region where air aircraft engines were produced. Because in that region, you had, uh, of course, the companies, you had the research institutes, you had the libraries, you had all those elements related to this industry. Uh, today, you have a general access to this kind of knowledge. And all what you have to do is to appropriate that kind of knowledge and to anchor it into your activity, okay? And so the, the, the shape of territorial knowledge dynamic, as we, we call them, is very different today. And of course, this could be called, let's say, the productive city, okay? And we have many examples, I don't know, Italian industrial clusters or research centers or creative cities or CBDs uh, and so on and so forth. These are typical, let's say, landscape of this productive city. Second uh, element, the question of the mobility of capital. This is linked, of course, to the famous Big Bang of the city in 1986. And this gave, gave rise to a totally different shape, which is the global city the global city and of course all the regions uh, that are under the control of the global city because most of the decision power has been transferred towards uh, financial centers uh, today. And this also gave rise to very typical uh, uh, landscapes like the, here, uh, the city of London or uh, Hong Kong. You've all have seen these uh, various pictures many, many times. Finally, we have this consumption city because uh, uh, we have now this uh, generalized uh, uh, mobility of consumers, which, re, uh, which changes a lot of things in uh, urban and regional development. And the consumption city uh, is about capturing, anchoring this time the consumer's expenses, okay? Every region, every city today has to compete in order to capture these expenses. Otherwise, there are very big leaks and this region may become, uh, may, be, uh, may become quite poor, as I shall so see, uh, as I shall show, sorry. Here, of course, you have uh, examples that you all know about over tourism, like uh, Venice, Barcelona, but you also have <clears throat> other kinds of uh, consumption cities, which are, uh, I don't know, shop big shopping centers, specialized shopping centers, or here the Vanda Culture Tourism City, Hefei, in China, in China, uh, very big companies like Vanda uh, are building very quickly uh, entire resorts, for example, entire res uh, uh, consumption cities re or tourism resorts, for example, for the Olympic Games and that kind of stuff. Okay, so a very big issue today, the consumption city. Now let's uh, try to articulate these uh, various types of globalization with theories, existing theories. First, we shall take the Hoyt um, export-based theory. Okay, you've all heard about this. Uh, and Harvey, uh, Harbin, uh, Harvey Urban Development Theory. Let's say we, you have here the local regional scale and you have, let's say, manufacturing production, which, is, which develops. And the products are sold on global, so-called global markets for goods and services. This is the local global uh, framework that emerged at the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s. Of course, you have incomes from the exports, which are coming into the region. And these incomes are, of course, uh, partly uh, paid to, for example, workers. These workers, of course, need local services, 
commerce, and so on and so forth. And they, of course, rent house, uh, housing, or re there is a rental market for commerce and all that kind of stuff. And this is the very classical development process of an industrial city. I mean, income comes in through uh, companies, companies pay uh, wages to workers and workers uh, pay for the development downstream of the city, various services, schools, uh, housing, uh, all that kind of stuff, which is locally induced, let's say. Let's now shift to Harvey. Harvey, it's the same kind of picture, but Harvey is working on investments, not on income flows. He's saying, okay, we have a primary secret of capital accumulation here in production, mainly manufacturing, and capitalists at a certain moment uh, uh, operate some kind of switching. There is a capital switching. They invest into the city, into the building, built environments. And here we have a second accumulation, so, sorry, secondary secret of capital accumulation. But mainly the, 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 the picture is the same, okay, whether by Harvey or by Hoyt. It's, a, it's the picture of an industrial or productive, let's say, urban production uh, city. Let's now look to what's going on today and we shall, we shall introduce the global city. And the global city changes considerably the secrets. For instance, we do no longer have a local accumulation of capital. Why? because the companies are owned by groups and all the profits are no longer uh, reinvested locally, which means that there is no more local or regional accumulation process. The region is no longer a relevant space for capital accumulation. Profits are directed towards the global city and from there reallocated in such or such country or such or such uh, region. The same for the savings of people which are no longer or less than previously uh, invested in local banks. Uh, so of course we do no longer have these uh, Harvey uh, flows of reinvest local reinvestment. And now let's consider the mobility of consumers. The mobility of consumers also develops in uh, special forms, which is quite different of what uh, I have spoken up to now. Uh, it's, let's say, uh, the, 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 the space is an inter-urban inter uh, competing market. So, okay, let's, for example, take the example of the, of the network of the cities, which is generated by low-cost uh, airplane companies. Okay, you have, uh, I don't know, Lisbon, Berlin, uh, uh, London, and so on and so forth. And all these companies are all these, sorry, all these cities are competing in order to attract tourists. And of course, some, some have had a great success, others uh, have less success. This is only one example, but it gives you the idea here. And of course, this has lots of impacts on the local consumption. I mean, we have here uh, tourists of many kinds that come into the city, and this has, of course, impact on the built environment. Because you, if you receive plenty of tourists, you will have to get bigger airports, uh, more hotels, more restaurants, uh, more museums, more leisure infrastructure, and so on and so forth. So we have here another kind of model of urban development, which is, let's say, we could call it post-productive, or I don't know what, uh, urban development model. Okay, is it clear for you up to now? Are there perhaps some remarks or questions? I cannot see you, so don't hesitate to, to open your microphone and, uh, and speak, please. Okay, let, let's shift to the question of value creation or rent creation or rent capture. Let's admit that you are a, a, a financial investor and that you are interested in, a, in a investing in real estate. So you, you are very happy, you want to build, let's say, an hotel or building blocks or housing blocks and that kind of stuff. How do uh, fi financiers think about that? They think like this. I mean, uh, okay, I build a, an hotel and from the, day fir the first day, of course, this hotel is losing value during, I don't know, 20 years. 
okay? Because my time horizon is that one. I build a house, I build a hotel, and I have 20 years in order to get my capital back. This is the, how, how financiers think about the, the built environment. And of course, we have the city is made of many, many of these kind of uh, investments at different periods of times. But as you know, the, the, the price of real estate does not correspond to this kind of picture, usually. What we can see is that through time, if you are lucky, in your, in your city, the price of real estate is, let's say, going up. With, of course, periods of stagnation, sometimes period of, of decrease, as we have seen, for example, with the example of uh, Riga uh, before. Riga has, uh, the, the real estate uh, prices in Riga fell by two uh, in 2009, if I, if I uh, have understood correctly. And, okay, but in, what is the difference between this view and this view? This view is a collective view. It, it, is, it is really the result of the evolution of the city or of the region, okay? And it is the general level of development of this region which generates externalities, and these externalities are captured by rent prices, okay? So we have to really to shift from the, an individual view towards a collective view, and this is really a territorial phenomenon. This is the important point. It is a territorial phenomenon. So what, what we, our main hypothesis consists in saying that if we had cities that were only, let's say, the addition of individual uh, building projects, we would probably have a city which would be constantly losing value and probably become, it would probably become obsolete after a certain period of time. Otherwise, if we have uh, uh, collective development, territorial development, uh, 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 um, better, better, better production, uh, better, better production, uh, better, uh, more competitive production, more attractive, um, more attractive um, infrastructures for tourism or mobile uh, consumers, and so on and so forth, and good quality of life for inhabitants, probably the the value of the city would go up. And of course, uh, a city which is, let's say, has a high value is a city which is, let's say, diversified, in deeply, uh, densely interconnected, uh, densely populated, let's say, a complex system, more complex system, and of course, very well inserted in globalization. So how can, how can we think about that? Uh, as I said, as I told you, we have Let's say that we have here the city. Here we have globalization. Globalization, uh, sorry, uh, urban development consists in having the city better in integrated in, in globalization, which means that it has developed knowledge, infrastructure, activities that are related to this, uh, to this globalization. But of course, there is some existing built environment and a class of uh, landowners that, and, and uh, owners of buildings that are benefiting from these externalities. Okay, this is a very classical view of rent theories. And these people see an increase in the prices of the, the, the houses without investing, without working. It is the, how, how rents work we have redistribution effects. And in many cases, these redistribution effects are uh, affecting deeply development because the question is about the contribution of these uh, owners to urban infrastructures and urban development. For example, there, is, there are some cities in where we have uh, strong negotiations and where people who benefit from the development have also to contribute to the development of some infrastructure. I don't know, public transportation, um, maybe uh, uh, museums uh, and so on and so forth. And we have places where this kind of collective financing of uh, common goods 
uh, is much more difficult or, or does not happen. Uh, regarding the, th the literature today, uh, I would say most of the contribution are now developing in, on this side. It, it's about rent capture, okay? And uh, you have uh, quite a lot of authors today, and we also contribute to, the, to this literature, who uh, uh, develop models about uh, rent capture. Uh, the, perhaps the most well-known of them is Manuel Albers today. Uh, yes, but the question is also how you combine this with the creation of urban value. How is it, uh, how do, does production, consumption, and financialization, how are they integrated within the city? How all these movements are integrated? And of course, it's the result of innovation, structural change, and uh, milieu effects within the city. So let's shift now. I know that you, you may see, you may think that I'm shifting from one thing to another one, but I hope that you will see very quickly the the, 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 the link between all of this. This is taken by uh, Camagni, let's say. And Camagni, as I told you before, uh, his view about rent is that rent is the better indicator about, let's say, a city development. If you, are, if you have high rents, it's because you have plenty of advantages that are linked to, to that place. If you have a very low rent, it means that you have very few advantages linked with that Place. And of course, it's a territorial phenomenon. It's not dedicated to one building, for example. In order to think to that, uh, Kamani says, okay, we can imagine uh, two, uh, two strange objects, the uh, aggregated supply of the city, the aggregated supply of the built environment of a city, all the, the buildings, the infrastructures that you can find in a city. And what was said also in the, in the presentation of Elena just before, uh, the supply of this built uh, environment is inelastic. Uh, in, uh, in French or in Italian, in Italian uh, real estate is called immobilier, immobiliare, which means of course that cannot move. It cannot move in, in, in space. Huh? But it is also very costly to adapt in time. I mean, to, to adapt a building is, is very expensive. Or if you have to destroy a building and rebuild one, of course, it is very costly. So, and it takes time. Demand, the aggregated demand for a city is uh, something that uh, all, the, all the, 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 the demands that exist. For example, if this seminar would have taken place in Sion, we would have collectively asked for, uh, let's say, uh, a train station, transportation. We would have asked for a place where to meet. We would have asked for a place where to eat. We would have asked for a place where to, to have a beer after the seminar. And all this, of course, all these demand are additional demands for space in the city of Sion. Okay? So this is what uh, Kamani uh, means when he speaks of the aggregated demand for a city. Of course, this aggregated demand has a monetary dimension. I mean, if I want, if I need food at a certain moment, I can go in a supermarket and buy food. Okay, this is monetary. But of, I need also streets, for example, or parks. And streets, I, cannot, I will not pay for streets, but it's a demand that I have, which I cannot pay for it directly. So it has to be uh, provided by the public hand. Okay? Is it uh, okay for you? Uh, to that point? So the demand is the amount of people that want to live in the city, right? Right. The demand of people, but also the demand of, for example, companies. For example, mm -hmm. a manufacturing companies is asking for some industrial estate, some, some places where to produce. Okay? Or the, the bus company is, ask, is asking for... For, for mm -hmm. kind of bus stops, mm -hmm. okay? So it's the yeah. demand. Yes? Other points? So let's translate this, uh, this uh, graph into a typology. The demand for a city can be split into two different uh, demands. The first is the demand of extra local people. 
and it's really it has to see with the insertion of the city into globalization okay and uh, a second demand is the demand for of inhabitants uh, this is this is very near to the export based theory huh? this distinction regarding the supply side of the of the city we can distinguish two elements the productive city the city as a productive agglomeration and most theories during the last uh, uh, 30 years were focusing as the on, uh, on the city as a place of production with all the externalities in terms of research of uh, uh, innovation and and so on and so forth okay but the, the the city is also a place of consumption a place of living a living environment and this is taking more and more importance in theories with the presential economy the the residential economy uh, all, all, all these uh, consumption services and i would relate it for example to the presentation of moise uh, before because he was focusing on these uh, on this kind of on indicators that are mostly uh, focusing on the region as a living environment okay so let's take the four types now the first is about the very traditional way of looking at the uh, regional development manufacture we call it manufacturing for example chinese people extra local demand like very much swiss watches but no longer now with the coronavirus it's catastrophic uh, fall in in in, in uh, watch uh, sales uh, but let's say up to now they they were very uh, they like they used to buy lots of watches it's of course the city the swiss region which are producing watches are productive regions are seen as productive regions classical uh, case here we need industrial estates campus and so on and so forth a second case would be about let's say we call it tourism but it, it all the, the the forms taken by the mobility of consumers can be students that because students uh, need more and more years today in order to complete their study and they are more and more numerous uh, can be retired people because retired people live long, longer and longer and very often they live in other places other cities other countries it's for example in Switzerland, can you imagine that 30%, 30 percent, 30 persons of the rents paid by the Swiss, um, Swiss pension system are paid abroad, 30 percent. So it means one third of the of retired people go elsewhere in order to, to spend their, their retirement. So it's, it's, uh, it's important. The third box is about local services. Uh, so you have plenty of local services dedicated to local people, inhabitants, schools, public parks, uh, local services, public services or, 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 or private services and so on and so forth. And the fourth box is quite interesting. It's short supply chains. Uh, up to now, it is economically not very, very important, but it is uh, gaining a lot of importance today uh, because people want more and more uh, uh, short secret, short uh, channels, sorry, short, short channel. Uh, for example, in energy uh, with, uh, of course, uh, photovoltaic panels and all that kind of stuff, or in food, uh, because people want to have a local provision, uh, food provision. If there is some kind of deglobalization today, of course, it will mean there is an increase in this kind of uh, activities within the region, okay? And the, the economic model which is behind this is of course the sub substitution of imports in, instead of importing energy we will produce more uh, locally okay and okay th this is up to now not really uh, original i mean it's just a typology which links urban value with several types of activities okay but the important point is that today we absolutely need to combine different of different boxes let me take an example manufacturing regions in europe they are highly competitive today they, they sell worldwide their products what is the problem the problem is that they are very often poor i mean they have a low uh, uh, income per, per capita and 
very often they have not such a good um, quality of life. What is the problem with that? The problem is that workers, local workers, and especially those who have a lot of money, will spend their money elsewhere. They will go in other places in order to get leisure, to spend the, in shop, to shopping centers uh, for, for holidays. They will send their the, the children elsewhere to, 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 to study and so on and so forth. And the result of this is that uh, even competitive regions have to, have to look for uh, their attractiveness if they don't want to lose their, their, their own, uh, their own um, consumers, okay? This is one example. But there are, of course, many of these interdependencies between these activities. Here you have, of course, examples about over-tourism, about the, the fact that productive regions, industrial regions, are usually not attractive for residents, and they are not attractive for tourists, and, and so on and so forth. And you have plenty of, of problems that are linked to this. Mainly, we can see that there are three types of tensions that should be converted into synergies for, uh, let's say, uh, uh, an interesting uh, urban development. The first one, you have all heard about it. It's about uh, the tensions between the presence of tourists and the presence of inhabitants, because you have plenty of mechanisms here uh, linked with, uh, with uh, the real estate market, with uh, prices in restaurants and, and other places, uh, and so on and so forth, that uh, have developed. We have tensions between production activities that are usually repulsive and inhabitants. Very often we have these very clear cut differences between uh, places of living and really uh, industrial estates. Okay? And this produces regions uh, and landscapes that are usually not that attractive. But this, of course, can be changed. The same with production and tourists. Uh, usually it's, it's, uh, it's repulsive, but we have some examples. For example, here you have the Zolferine here, and or here in, uh, in my region you have chocolate fat factories that uh, have opened, of course, museums and uh, demonstration uh, activities, uh, and so on and so forth. So th this is the, 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 the stake, how to transform tensions into synergies, okay? And this is the last, uh, well, not, not exactly the last slide, but I'm arriving at the end of my presentation. And this slide is unhappily a little bit complicated. And once you will no longer understand anything, it will mean that uh, I have finished, okay? So let's start with the state of the city. This city is more or less competitive, more or less attractive, more or less inserted in this changing globalization. And this city has a given real estate. The built environment, of course, is quite inelastic. So it, there are difficulties in order to make it evolve in the middle term. What we have seen is that there is an aggregated demand for the city. And this demand for the city is, let's say, external, but is also internal. And all these people and uh, players are competing for, uh, for space within the city. It's the presential competition, okay? Uh, students are competing with elderly people for perhaps for cheap apartments. Uh, industrial companies are competing for space uh, with, uh, let's say, uh, the municipality who wants to develop the social housing and so on and so forth. So we have this comp competition on the demand side. Regarding the supply side, we have this literature and this, uh, this, clear, this uh, difference between, on the one hand, rent capture. Rent capture through capitalization. Those players that uh, take profit from externalities that are provided by a good insertion of the city in the globalization. So without then doing anything, they get more money or they get a higher value for their, uh, for their houses, okay? On the other hand, the insertion of the city in globalization requires, of course, uh, requ uh, real estate projects. 
uh, better infrastructures, I don't know, museums, um, campuses, uh, perhaps uh, better, better public transportation and so on and so forth, or, or con uh, conference centers and so on and so forth. Of course, these projects are contributing, contributing to the insertion of the city within globalization, okay? So they're not only capturing the rent, they contribute also to reinforce uh, this, rent, this, uh, this urban value. But is, of course, there is a real estate competition, which is traditionally um, managed by planning authorities and that kind of stuff, huh? which is a complex problem. And finally, we of course need some kind of coordination between the supply and the demand. And inside cities, we have, let's say, these milieu effects of the various players of the city, which are taking decisions, making investments, more or less coordinated. And, uh, uh, um, and, and the question is, how does this governance uh, occur? Uh, sometimes it is, of course, highly, let's say, uh, coordinated. Sometimes it's totally spontaneous. Sometimes you have different milieu, like the I don't know, industrialists on the one side, uh, uh, the municipality on the other side, or perhaps uh, lobbies about, uh, about uh, tourism, some resource, for instance, and on the other side, the inhabitants. Of course, the question is how do all these players coordinate? Are there some places where they meet and discuss and coordinate? Are there some participation processes or not within such or such city? This is the question of the urban milieu, of the various negotiations uh, that can take place or not in order to uh, renew the city. And of course, this, uh, all these elements are going to lead to either, let's say, a renewal of this city or to some kind of obsolescence. And, uh, and, and of course, it is the result of, of these, this link between, let's say, local dynamics and the insertion uh, in, in globalization. And of course, this is a continuous uh, processes. Uh, last slide, just in order to sum up, to summarize all this. First point that financialization has today a very big impact on cities and especially about on, uh, on large cities. Real estate is no longer driven by local exports. Uh, real estate is becoming a more and more a driving and autonomous uh, uh, activity, more and more autonomous. Before, you ne you're needing some kind of, uh, let's say, money coming from exports. Today, uh, you can just get in uh, inflows of capital that help you to develop uh, a new city. Let's take the example of Spain in the 2000s. It was exactly that. You had money from international financial markets that was arriving in some places and you could develop entire cities normally dedicated to uh, Northern Europe, uh, retired people, but, uh, but, but this was not the point. The point was about putting capital into the real estate sector, okay? W without local uh, effective demand, in fact. So, and the, 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 let's say, the, the hypothesis that we are working on is that this financialization is of course a danger because, because financialization means that the, 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 the rents are being paid to the, the global city are no longer reinvested locally. There is no longer a local accumulation system. But of course, it is also possible to negotiate. And even if you have some kind of a good, uh, uh, discussions, discussion and negotiation within the city and that you manage to organize yourself uh, in front of, let's say, these players, probably that you can take some advantage of the financialization of urban activities. This is the hypothesis we have and we are working on. So thank you for your attention. I have uh, finished now. <laughs>